Hello, and welcome to module 5.6. In this video, we're going to look at coherent integration, including implementation losses. You'll remember the previous video, we looked at ideal coherent integration, where we had idealized noise. And now we're going to look at what happens in practice. So we begin with where we ended on the previous video. And you'll remember that we ended with this simple formula that the ideal coherent gain in the presence of uncorrelated noise comes out to be this, that the SNR grows as the value n, the number of samples that we choose to integrate uh, in our integrator. And here we had two integrators because we'd done this trick of separating the noise from the signal for the purpose of analysis. So that's our beginning point. And so now what we're going to look at is something that we call implementation losses to account for the real life effects that happen to the signal. So we begin on the left, and we can it's, it's OK to, at this stage to pretend that everything is ideal, including the noise. You can, you can imagine that the, the noise you begin with is truly uncorrelated. And then as we pass through the filters, typically band pass filters, in the front end of the receiver, everything the signal and the noise will be filtered. And this causes a loss which we label delta IF for the IF for the intermediate frequency because at this stage, uh, right before the analog to digital converter, we have intermediate frequency, which you'll remember from the receiver architecture lectures in module four. So the thing to notice here is that in, in terms of the signal, if the signal was perfectly plus 1 and minus 1, which it is when it leaves the satellite, the PR encode is plus 1s and minus 1s, once it passes through a filter, the value of these voltages, or these values, will not be quite plus 1 and minus 1. They'll, they'll be passing through some filter, and they'll take some other value. And so that has one effect on the signal, which means that when we do the correlation, we won't quite get a perfect triangle. It'll be rounded at the top. And then the other effect is that the noise itself becomes correlated in time. That one sample of noise is very similar to another sample of noise right next to it. And so the speed at which you can sample to, is a function of the noise bandwidth. If you sample too fast, you'll start to get replicas of the noise, and it will no longer be uncorrelated. So that's something we have to take into account. Uh, in this of course, we don't have time to go into great detail in that. If you, if you want to dig in more detail, it's in the AGPS book. Uh, but what we'll do to, in today's video is just show you some examples of, of specific values that, that delta IF takes in typical receiver architecture. So that's, that's the first loss that we get from the filtered noise. And that already gets us towards reality away from the ideal uh, coherent gain that we just looked at in the previous video. So the, the next thing is to look at what happens after the A to D converter, the analog to digital converter. And we get something called quantization noise. And this is, repli this is represented here at the top uh, by looking at this. Fil imagine this, this filtered value has taken this term, which would have been a minus 1, and made it something different. And then when we quantize, just so you can imagine that that term gets quantized up there. And so that the quantized value, which is now, again, plus 1 and minus 1, one of the minus 1 values that we began with here could have been changed to a plus 1 value. So, so this will have some effect in terms of loss of signal. And we represent that by delta Q for quantization loss. All right, the next thing that we have is we, we have this mixer. And we've looked at this in, in detail uh, when we studied mixers. And we, we saw that if this frequency going into the mixer was exactly the same as the carrier frequency there. Then we stripped off the signal exactly. But if it wasn't the same, then, then we had some residual phase. And we would fall down this frequency curve, which you remember was the sync function. And we analyzed that in some detail in a, in a recent video. And we call that value delta f. You remember we designed that typically to be around 1 dB in the worst case. And then finally, we have our correlators. And we have an, another loss uh, called the code alignment loss. And this comes about fr from a function of where our samples happen to be and how many of them we have per chip. And you can, and what's represented here, you imagine you have two samples per chip, which is typical when you're trying to acquire the signal. 
one of them could fall on this side of the peak, and one of them could fall on that side of the peak. And so you actually don't have a sample right at the peak. So your maximum possible signal to noise ratio is not quite achieved because you, you get things either side. And so sometime later, it's possible that as, because your clock is running at a slightly different rate to the satellite clock, you get some sample there and some sample there, and then you do get one sample right on the peak. And this changes with time, and the average of all of this gets collected in this term, the code alignment loss. And so we have these four losses, the filtering loss and IF frequency, the quantization loss, delta Q, the frequency mismatch loss, and the code alignment loss. And so all of that, those together account for all the real life losses that we have. And then we can correctly do the analysis of the whole chain of the receiver. And the way we're going to show it here is I've taken that receiver block diagram, which by now you're familiar with, and flipped it on the side, put it over to the left, and we'll have a matching spreadsheet on the right and work our way through it. Okay, so the, this spreadsheet that we start with uh, should look somewhat familiar. Uh, this is similar to what we did when we worked on Friese's formula. And you'll remember that with Friese's formula, we worked out this value of effective temperature. And so there it is, this 296K. So we worked that out several videos back. And by multiplying by Boltzmann's constant, we get the noise power density. And multiplying by the bandwidth, we get the noise power. And so that's this term here, noise power. And in this column E, it's just showing you the actual equations that you would have to implement in a spreadsheet if the spreadsheet was labeled like this one through N and A, B, C, D, E, like a typical Excel spreadsheet. So that's how we work out the noise power. So we've seen this before. And we just assume that we begin with a certain signal strength. Uh, we, we assumed minus 130 dBm here, which is uh, as we've seen before, typical signal strength at the antenna. And, and now here is where I'm going to show you some typical values inside a receiver. So I just mentioned the bandwidth. 3 megahertz is a typical bandwidth for a consumer GPS receiver. And so we put that value there, and that, that shows up in, the, in this term. And so we have our noise power, we have our signal power, and so the signal-to-noise ratio at the intermediate frequencies is just the signal power minus the noise power. And so that, that comes out to be this value minus 20 dBs, minus 20 decibels. So that's telling us that the signal is 20 dB or 100 times smaller than the noise at the IF. So remember where the IF is. That's So we've got IF, SNR, and IF is right over there. Okay. So let's join those up. So that's that numerically shows you what we've been trying to show graphically. We've, we've mentioned that the signal is buried in the noise here. And we need to do the correlation to bring the signal out. Well, here you see it quantitatively, that the signal is actually 100 times smaller than the noise. And this is, this is with a fairly strong signal. Minus 130 dBm is an outside signal strength. If you moved indoors or uh, underneath some kind of tree canopy, it would be less than that. And so that motivates for you why we need to do all of this correlation, which we're, we're going to do next. So, so that's the, the next step. And we, we begin with the ideal coherent integration formula that we just talked about in the previous video. So we, and to, to do that, to, to work with that, we we have to define what our sample rate is. And I mentioned previously that two samples per chip is a very common uh, sample rate for initial acquisition of the signal, which is what we're looking at here. And the signal is 1.023 megabits per second. That's the chipping rate of the PRN code. So two samples per chip means that we're sampling at 2.046 megahertz. And we have to choose a coherent interval. How long do we? accumulate the signal for. And we're going to choose one millisecond, which we've, we've, is a number we've used before. It exactly matches the length of the PRN code, so it's a natural number to use. But now we're going to see, does it work if we use one millisecond? Is that enough of a signal? Well, we're about to see. So if we're sampling at 2.046 megahertz times a millisecond, we get 2,046 sample points. And we label those MC here, so M for the number of, of points we, 
we don't use n. We try, not, we try to avoid n when we do these spreadsheets so as not to be confused with the term n for noise. So when we count points, we'll use an m here. Later on, we'll see m sub nc for non-coherent. But for now, it's all just coherent integration. So we've got m sub c, 2046 points. And then the ideal coherent gain that we saw in the previous video is 10 log, and here I've got m. I really should have m c in that equation. 10 log the number of points, and that just comes out 33 db. So that's the ideal coherent gain. So that's the gain we would have if everything was ideal. I can't really show that on the left here on the, on the block diagram of the receiver because all along in the receiver there are real losses which we are going to account for next. And so here they are, these four values. So there's, and I'm going to show you typical values of each of these. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you want to dig in deeper, we don't have time in this course, but each of these is discussed in great depth in the AGPS textbook. Uh, that goes along with the course. So the the IF value uh, that the filtering loss that we get at IF because of the bandpass filters for a typical receiver with three megahertz of bandwidth and two samples per chip, the sampling rate is slow enough that the noise essentially is uncorrelated. And to the first decimal point of dBs, you get 0.0, .0 dB. So really no loss there. The quantization loss for three bit A to D quantization loss, you can have Typical values of, quant of A to D converters in consumer GPS are 2-bit, 3-bits, and 4-bits. I've just chosen 3-bits as an example, and this is something you can look up in tables. You get 0.2 of a dB in lo of loss. And the way I choose to do these spreadsheets is for these losses, I show them as negatives, so we can just add up everything in the spreadsheet, so it makes it a simple way uh, to do it. Then for the frequency mismatch, well, this is something that you, we've looked at in detail, the sync function here. The, you remember the sine pi f t over pi f t, where t is the integration time. Uh, we, by design, we chose it that the worst case value was 1 dB. And so the value we choose to put in the spreadsheet for analysis is halfway between the best case, which would be no loss, and the worst case, 1 dB, so half a dB of loss there. And then the, the coherent uh, sampling space loss for two samples per chip. Again, you can look this up, and it comes out to be minus 1.2 dB. So there are all the losses. We add them all together. We have 1.9 dB of implementation losses that will modify our ideal coherent gain. And so the practical coherent gain is just 33.1 minus 1.9. So that's this value here, 31 dB. And so now we can associate that with the block diagram, because each of these value, the delta IF, would have occurred here. So if we want to put these things on the block diagram, the quantization loss would have been in the ADD converter, which would be right there. So the quantization loss would have occurred there. The frequency mismatch is a, a, occurs here when if we don't get this frequency quite right. So this would be delta F. So that's that sync function that we analyzed previously. And then uh, the code alignment loss would would happen here in our correlators. Delta C would happen here, it, where we don't have the code exactly aligned with the incoming code. That's where each of these would occur. And we just choose to split them up for the purpose of doing the accounting. But now that we've done that, the actual coherent gain is what happens as a combination of this correlation and the integration. And so that matches this actual coherent gain. And so we can join that up. So now you can see where the IFSNR is up, up here and where the coherent gain can, can be attributed to. And, and so now we can say, OK, well, our IFSNR was this value, minus 20.9 dB. And we've got coherent gain of 31 dB. So we just add those up. And hooray, we get a positive number, 10 dB. That's the coherent SNR in, in dBs. And so, our, and so that's a positive number. It means we expect the correlation result, that triangle, to be sticking up of, above the noise by about 10 times about. But exactly how much? What do we mean by that? So 10 dB sounds like a good amount. What does it look like in terms of a ratio? Uh, well, to, to work that out, we must go and invert the dB 
equation. And so, so, so now comes a time where you have to think back to that DB lecture that we had where we said when we look at magnitude ratios, you have to square magnitude ratios before you get a power ratio. So when we do the reverse, we have to take DB divided by 20 and raise that raise 10 to the power of that value. And that gives you the magnitude ratio. And so we're left with this 3.3 ratio, which is corresponds to this 10 dB of signal to noise ratio of power. And so that's saying, telling us we expect this peak to be three times higher than the standard deviation of that noise, which for a typical receiver, that's just enough that you could expect to see that peak above the noise. And, and what does that actually look like? Let's look at in this slide. So here's some actual data where we've got noise samples here. And oh, it's completed. So there's all the noise samples. And then there's the peak. And there's an actual magnitude of 3.3. So that's what it looks like. And then if we did, did the reverse calculation, uh, peak over standard deviation is 3.3. And to take power ratios, we square it, 3.3 squared. And take 10 log 10 of that, we're back to our 10 dB uh, of SNR.